The following is a message from Christ Central Manchester, a church that meets in the heart of Manchester in the UK. To find out more about us, please visit www.christcentral.org.uk. And uh, this morning we're carrying on in the book of Amos. Um, and before we get into that, I just want to um, recap that first couple of parts, first couple of times we've been looking into the book of Amos. Um, we saw, we saw God's judgment. If you remember, it was the same week that the, um, the Westminster Bridge attack happened, I believe. And we talked about God's judgment on all the evil that goes on. And, um, and there was something quite timely about that, that actually he sees it all. And although it can seem like it goes unpunished, and that's what we see in the book of Amos at the beginning, it won't go unpunished, even though... As it says with this kind of poetic phrase, for three sins and for four, there will come a time. He will let three or four hundred sins go, but eventually it will all come to uh, his judgment. It will all come to um, be judged. And, uh, and, And we feel right about that when it's horrendous, heinous crime or sin done against us. You know, people are... Uh, violently killed, or you know, we, we, we believe in judgment for that. We less, we are less keen about judgment when it's on our own little white lies or whatever, you know. But it's all gonna be judged. We saw that, and then we saw this roaring lion, as this is, as he's described, not only judging the nations around Israel, but then coming up very close to the people of Israel themselves, which was suddenly a very uncomfortable moment. Suddenly, the lion that they were very happy about judging everybody else is up close and personal. And our focus this week is in chapter 3, 4 and 5. We're not going to read them all out, you'll be glad to hear. But we're going to look at some themes of what it is that God is judging in his own people. Because this is a shock of Amos. He's not just judging those around them, he's judging them. And this week we see what is it that they have been doing, what have they been getting up to that has so angered him that he's going to bring such judgment on them and is described like a roaring lion who will basically devour his own people. Let's read, and we'll see these themes as we read. Amos 3, verse 9 to 15 to begin with, and then we'll pick out a couple of other passages in these next couple of chapters. Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and to the fortresses of Egypt. These are... Old enemies of Israel who are being invited in to the courtroom of God to be witnesses against Israel. And that in itself is an insult to the people of Israel. That these old enemies who they have thought so little of are being brought in to judge them or to be a part of the judgment of them. Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria in Israel. See the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, who store up in their fortresses what they have plundered and looted. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun your land, pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd rescues from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear. In other words, not much. So will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued. Not much. With only the head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. Hear this and testify against the descendants of Jacob, declares the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. And skip to chapter 4 verse 1. Hear this, this is an interesting verse. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness. The time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through breaches in the wall, and you will be cast out towards Harmon, declares the Lord. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is not going well, guys. Even their worship is not great. 
Then, for the rest of chapter 4, God says that even when times were hard economically, because they're doing well, many of them are rich and doing very well. This is a big theme we're going to get to. But even when they haven't been doing well economically, they still didn't turn to him, to God, and, to, and repent. And then we skip to chapter 5, verse 11. You levy a, ta- a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offences and how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. And then, lastly, verse 21 of chapter 5. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring, a choice, you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Imagine hearing that for the first time. I think part of the problem is they didn't hear it. Our title is Religiosity Wreaks Havoc. And first of all, before we get into this, although we're not going to announce our gift day total today, you might have been waiting for that, we want to give everybody a chance to give who hasn't had that opportunity. Maybe you weren't here last week or you forgot and so we want to kind of give the grand total after today. So I'd be, li- I'd be listening out in the next couple of days on the social media because we're going to put it on there first and then make a big announcement next Sunday as well. I want to just introduce today by saying that the greed and the selfishness that's being described here is a warning to us. In light of recent, in light of last week, it is not. I believe for the majority of us, applicable. The generosity that has been expressed and I trust is being expressed today is remarkable. What was given last Sunday, what will be given this Sunday is a sweet fragrance and heartfelt kind of sacrificial giving And it flies in the face of this religiosity and greed and everything that it leads to that we'll see in a moment. You have given generously. And um, we just want to say thank you. Again, I can't tell you the specifics just yet because I think we want to just give everybody the chance to be involved. But can I just say, it's already a game changer. What's happened already is a game changer. What we were going for and what's been given... And so between you and God, he will bless you as you've given sacrificially, as you've given joyfully, as you've obeyed his leading in it, the Holy Spirit leading you. That's between you and him. We can't kind of get involved in that. What we can say as a leadership is thank you because it's a kind of twin thing. We give because we give to God first. We love him. We honor him with our, and we trust him with our finances. But we also, as we looked last week, we give to him first. But we also give often to certain visions and certain kind of um, directions and and so we set that out last week and you've given to that so for that we want to say it's been moving what's happened and uh, we want to just say thank you so much for getting behind us in this incredible way as you will hear Um, so this isn't to address a current issue in us I don't believe on the whole it might be one or two people have got to think this through but it is at least a warning What we read here, what we're going to look at this morning is a warning to us. How one thing can lead to another, can lead to another. How religiosity, going through religious observance and going through the motions can lead to greed, which can lead to oppression of the poor or oppression of the marginalised and looking down our noses at others. So that's what we're going to look at. But it's a warning. First of all, this greed and oppression that we see which is the kind of outworking of what we're going to get onto in a moment in terms of the religiosity. And last week I told the story of these two Russian boys who 
were adopted, do you remember? If you were here. These two boys who were adopted out of an orphanage where they actually were in pretty rough is an understatement circumstances. They were lying in the dark most of the time and they were found when this couple who were going to adopt them turned up. They were found lying in their own waist in these uh, cots in the dark. And they struggled to come out of the orphanage. Not, I mean, they, they brought them out and they struggled to acclimatise to being out of the orphanage. They, they had got so used to these difficult circumstances that they tr treated it as home and saw it as home. And so even as they were leaving, they were kind of literally reaching back in the car ride. They were freaked out by sunlight, freaked out by the wind, freaked out by the car ride. Everything was so new. And the newly adopted parents knew that these boys had begun to settle in their new home when they stopped hiding and hoarding food in their high chairs. Do you remember me saying that? That's when they knew that there was a breakthrough. They stopped hiding food because they knew that their next meal was going to come. They weren't sure when they lived in an orphanage. We'll come back to this illustration. It ties in again, believe it or not, even with what we've been reading. Because in these passages, some themes emerge. God is going to judge them. God is going to judge his people. They have blown it too many times. They have really blown it. There's no way back, it would seem, although later on we see a glimpse of hope for them. But the main things that they are guilty of, we have heard loud and clear and have been repeated loud and clear. It is this religiosity that we'll get onto, but then that leads to this greed and this oppression of the less well-off, of the marginalised, of the poor, injustice to them. God hates that. We'll get on to what Jesus thinks about it when we see him in the New Testament in a moment. But they're described as greedy, not just rich, because the Bible doesn't condemn being well off. They are affluent, but they're affluent through greed. And their affluence has not led them to worship God or reverence Him. It's led them to more, more gathering, more hoarding. It's led, led them to this orphan kind of mentality of even though we've got loads, we're going to keep hiding it and hoarding it. And God couldn't be clearer to his people. He is going to get them. They are in so much trouble. They've blatantly offended him. To the point where, I don't know if you noticed it, I kind of paused at this point. It's a kind of profound moment in verse 9 of chapter 3. Where he summons... Well, there's two things that goes on. There's, there's this summoning of... And I explained it as we were reading. The summoning of these foreign old enemies who the Israelites would naturally look down upon as people who actually were oppressive to others, people who were cruel, people who were violent, people who were guilty of these very things they were being accused of. And they're the ones, the old enemies are the ones who are, bringing, are being brought in to, to be witnesses to this divine courtroom where God is, his, God is putting his people in their place. They are a stench in his nostrils. In verse 10, chapter 3, it talks about them storing up the gains of their violence and oppression. But actually, it's not just, commentators believe, it's not just that they stored up the gains. It's not just that they stored up the wealth that came from this horrendous behaviour. It's like they stored up the behaviour itself. They stored up the violence. They kind of treasured how violent they had become and how out of their greed. And all of that is going to get them for it. They are in massive trouble. It's like it's being stored up against their credit, against their account. What they have done is become greedy and oppressive in the way that their enemies historically were famous for. And they haven't even realised it. So God brings the enemies in. That's you. No, we're not like that. Are we like that? <coughs> One question I had in preparing this is, I wonder, does, does religiosity, and what I mean by religiosity is, because it can be positive, but I mean it in a negative way. I mean going through the motions, as we'll see, kind of just turning up to church, just singing the songs, doing the right things, not watching those particular films, but keeping your nose clean and where it becomes just pat, formulaic, dry, 
horrible. They had done all, and, and then boasting in how great a believer you are, how great the people of God we are, as they were. Where, does that always lead to greed and oppressing people? I'm not sure it does. I don't think ever, life's ever that black and white. We know people that don't even believe there is a God who are nicer than many Christians I know. Do you know what I mean? We know some really nice humanists. We know some really nice atheists. And actually, their social conscience sometimes is more impressive than much of the church globally. So I don't think it's always black and white. We, don't, we haven't got to look for a formula that says, if you love God, you'll be generous. If you don't love God, you won't be generous. It just doesn't work like that. We wish it would, because it would just kind of prove a few things, but it just doesn't. But what we can say is, here, and often we know it, religiosity results in a them and us attitude, which means I'll look after my own interests and not be generous. I'll hoard, protect my corner, and slowly begin more and more to look down upon others to the point where I ignore them. And I might even use some Bible verses to back up my case. Have you ever heard anyone use the words of Jesus to justify their hard-heartedness towards people who are poorer than them. You ever heard that? Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. I heard a story recently about some people that, Christians, self, you know, Jesus-loving, church-attending, worshipful Christians who use that, that verse, where Jesus is being anointed by on one of these occasions where he's being anointed with expensive perfume and people complain that that perfume, the money, the, the, it could have been sold and money given to the poor. Well, Jesus says, don't worry, on this occasion, actually, you're not going to have me with you for very long, but the poor you will always have with you. That was not carte blanche for never look after the poor. Because as we know from elsewhere in the New Testament, exactly, in particular on one occasion where Paul's talking about how he was encouraged by the other church leaders in Jerusalem, I think, to look after the poor. He says, that was the very thing I was keen to do. So you can't use Jesus' words and pull them out of the Bible and say, oh, it means we don't look after the poor anymore, we don't look after the marginalised, because they're always here. They're just a pain in the neck in the corner. We're just going to get on with the important stuff. Christians can do that. And this is kind of what they've begun to do. And we come back to this sore point for them, that their old enemies, who were renowned for being violent, were brought in. Because Israel had become violent and oppressive, even looking after or not looking after their own. Egypt, verse 9, would help to judge, would witness. And friends, when the church is seen as no more caring than a godless nation or society around, then the church is in trouble. On a positive note, I think at the moment, the whole national food bank scene, which is driven by Christians, driven by the church, a lot of it is, is just loud and clear, we're here to help people who are without food. Even this week, Channel 4, our own food bank, if you saw it, great. Mervyn's on there. One of our work, guys that works in the office for the food bank. And he, he did really well. He tried to avoid all the political questions and did really well. We want to be famous for that. We don't want to be famous for all that we're against. We don't want to be famous for ignoring those who are without. That's what they're famous for. They've gone down in history, this particular group of the people of God at this time. Now we're called to follow God and not impress society. We're not about impressing society. We're to follow God. And God's heart is you look after the poor. And if you impress society, then great. But God followers should show care whether society around them is caring or not. And I just want to add that generosity is not always financial or material. We can be generous with each other or greedy for our own, as it were, and, and hoarding and, and, 
and scrimping in the whole area of relationships or, or friendships or hospitality or the way that we view others. We can be generous and think highly of them as the Bible instructs us to or we can think arrogantly and greedily and look out for what I can get out of friendships and relationships be it a marriage or be it just friendships we can we can think oh I'm gonna I'm gonna get what I can so this greed I'm sure wasn't just financial and we need to be careful we don't always just see greed or generosity in terms of finances and in the end the antidote to any greed is trusting God, closeness to Him, listening in every situation and every decision, walking with Him, the walk of faith, not a walk of self-reliance. And as we do that, we will then live out more and more, not perfectly, but more and more live out the way that Jesus was, as Paul instructs us to in Philippians 2, verse 3, to verse th- about verse 3. He says, Humil- In humility consider others better than yourselves, Look to their interests. That's the generosity I'm talking about. It's not just financial. Do you, do you consider others better than yourself? But Keith, what if they are rubbish? You know what I mean, sorry. What if they are, what if their life's in a mess? What if they, you know, I've got all these wrong attitudes. I've got to think of them. No, don't think, it's not saying bury your brain. But, Even begin to excuse them. Even begin to look for, not excusing them, but extenuating circumstances that may have caused them to act in that terrible way. The way that you might excuse yourself if you get caught, you know, if you're a driver, we excuse ourselves, don't we, if we've behaved wrongly on the road. You know, I I was in a rush. You know, that's what I think it's talking about. Look at others, treat them as you would want to be treated, and then some. Look more, look more highly on them than you would on yourself. That's generosity. That's not being greedy. I'm always right is greedy. They must be wrong is greedy. And you can't muster up that kind of generosity. It comes out of, as I've said already, knowing, remembering, trusting. I said, you know what? Knowing and remembering who you are and knowing and remembering, remembering who he is. You know, the people of Israel in the Old Testament, I, read a, I was reading one of the Psalms this morning in my quiet time, that brought it home again. And this is what, exactly what we've got going on in Amos. Their biggest cause of all their trouble is they forget who they are. We'll come back to it. They forget who they are, positively put. As we remember who we are, remember who he is, we stay on course. But this is the people of God. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. This is the people of God and he calls the women greedy cows. I I was brought up to believe that wasn't a right word to use about ladies. He calls them greedy cows. And the point that is being made is they are obsessed with their physical appetite like animals. They're obsessed with their physical needs rather than God and his ways or or other people. This is the people of God and their greed has led them to, yes, more houses, but trampling on the poor with taxes even on grain and they don't care. And they think that their wealth, it seems, justifies their actions. We're wealthy, therefore God is blessing us, therefore we're right. Now we can see this if we're not careful in certain theologies around the world. That if you are wealthy as a Christian, it means God is blessing you. And the danger then is poor Christians don't have enough faith or they're in sin. And rich Christians, whatever they're doing, must be okay because they're rich. That's, That's the extreme that some theologies around the world can lead us into. We've got to be careful. Yeah, God does bless. But Jesus wasn't a millionaire and didn't drive a Bentley. But I don't think he was in sin. The Bible's pretty clear he never did sin. 
I don't think he lacked faith or a relationship with his Father in heaven. So we've got to be careful. Jesus saw this kind of stuff in his day. Do you remember when he went to the temple? It made him angry in the temple to the point where he turned tables over. He didn't sin. He was angry that his father's house had been turned into a marketplace with dishonest, uh, corrupt practices. It should have been a house of prayer. It should have actually been the court of the Gentiles. It should have been where they were doing alpha for the nations. It should have been where they were introducing people to Judaism. And he said they were selling pigeons and corruptly. And he turned tables over. I remember my headmaster, who I think was a Buddhist, and very peace-loving, when I was in primary school. I remember him using that as um, the moment that Jesus sinned. He, he explained that to us. He didn't really know his Bible, I don't think. But he, he just assumed that if you turn some tables over and you're a little bit annoyed, that you've sinned. There is a place for righteous anger and Jesus acts in righteous anger just as God acts in righteous anger in, this chapter, in these chapters of Amos. At other times, Jesus, um, when, the, when the lady brings, you know, the widow brings her might to the temple, we assume that's just a wonderful occasion of generosity because she gave all she had. She just had a little bit left and she gave it. Remember that scene? And all these rich people come along and just give a little bit of a proportion of all that they've got. Possibly Jesus was also making a, a kind of social statement. How is it that she's in that boat and you are all very well off? Is a statement he might have been making as well as saying, how generous is she? Jesus looked on the crowds and had compassion. And was angry with the rulers of that day who lorded it over the crowds and put heavy burdens on them. And he said, my burden is light. Jesus saw the same injustices hundreds of years after God is judging it here. It doesn't go away. We keep coming back to it. Which is why it's a warning for us. As we get... As we acquire things, as we are blessed by God even. I would say everything comes from Him. All good gifts. But as we acquire, we have to be so careful... That as we become better off, we don't assume it, we don't do the assuming thing that I must be well, I must be doing right. We don't get hard hearted and begin to hoard it, but we're always soft. We've got to stay soft to the needs of those around us. And so secondly, I want us to move on to look at not only does, do the, the Israelites think that, they, that their wealth justifies their means? They think and they wrongly assume that their inherited position as the people of God means that they can behave as they want. Because we're the people of God. God says, no, with your position comes kind of a responsibility, but at least a way of life. You're, the, you're my people. You don't act like this, or well, you shouldn't be. This isn't what I expect from my people. You've forgotten who you truly are. The root of all this greed, all this oppression, is partly assuming that they were right because they were the people of God, but it's also they've begun to just trust themselves. Me, myself and I. There's a self-sufficiency here, a religiosity which is not the walk of faith. It's a religious observance. Have you ever thought about that phrase? Religious observance. What a disgusting phrase. It's grim. It's like God's a specimen in a zoo. And we're going to go along and just observe. We're going to just look at him. Oh, he's interesting. Next. Next animal. Religious observance. It's not relational. It's not worship. It's take it or leave it. It implies this horrible looking on. And this leads to, not always, but it leads here, 
And the danger is it can for us lead to a greed and then everything else that follows. But it starts with this wrong understanding. They've forgotten the privilege of knowing and being known. Now our position is a bit different. In Christ, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, it's a bit different. Okay, it's the... But the dangers are similar. We can forget who we are, who God is, what He has done, what He's made us, and then we can begin to just get by and observe the justify ourselves when we've been already justified. Ever thought that through? Or if I pray for 10 minutes today, that makes me a good Christian. Justify yourself. You've already been justified. Talk about the horse has bolted. Oh, God, I'm going to make myself... God will be impressed by me. He's already impressed by you because of the righteousness that was put on you at the cross when all the sin was taken off of you, that great exchange that we talked about last week. He's already very, very impressed with you. Believe me. You don't always feel it, which is why you want to pray, I'll do another couple of minutes. Oh, it's such hard work. What was I praying? Um, anyway, amen. Great Christian I am now. You already were a great Christian. You're the greatest Christian that's ever lived. Because you've got the righteousness that wasn't yours to begin with. That is now yours. This is a massive hobby horse of mine, so I'm going to have to be careful just to kind of rein it in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't in my notes, that's just natural comedic talent. <laughs> but we, when we do enough to perform, when we do enough to keep up religious appearances, you ever seen that Keeping Up Appearances series? Horrible. You ever seen it? I mean, it's not that funny, but cringeworthy as well. Mrs. Bouquet, whose real name is Bucket. Some like people say my name's not really gaming, it's gammon. It really is gaming. At school, I'd much rather have had gammon, if I'm honest. And many more, less connotations. It was bad enough gammon. But 20 years ago, that was still something you got picked on for, having a, silly, a name like that. She was called Mrs. Bucket, renamed herself Bouquet, and exactly what we're talking about here. Keeping up religious appearances. It's the difference between faith, which is the second point really, the difference between faith and religious observance. The difference between faith and religiosity. You see, legalism, where it's all about me and relying on me and performance, legalism will just give enough. Like, like last week, you'll just give enough at the gift day or, it? or relationally. You'll just, you'll just give enough. You'll just talk it up to somebody and be generous with your time. Just enough so that you feel better. And you'll... That's it, I've done you. You've, you've ticked you. Legalism or self-sufficiency, religios, religiosity, all these different words that I'm trying to use to describe the same thing. It's box tick, ticking. You're just ticking boxes on a list to say, I'm a good Christian. I do this, I do that, I don't do this, I don't do that. Legalism will give enough just to feel better. Faith and grace, which is when we understand we are recipients of the undeserved favour of God. That's what grace is, the undeserved favour of God. That, grace and faith, will keep giving until it's directed to stop. <laughs> it's much more fun, it's a lot scarier and probably more exhausting, but it's a lot... It's, it's, much more fun. Faith says, thank God for all he has done for me. What can I do? Legalism says, let me do this just to keep God in my, or to keep me in his good books, to keep God sweet. I want to thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Legalism says, we better say grace at every meal time. We better pray. We better thank God. Because that's what good Christians do. 
Faith says, thank you God all the time, including meal times. And by the way, there's no right answer on that. If you're wondering about whether you pray before a meal or not, we do. I think, one of the, I think we pray before we eat in the evening. We just want to keep that as a regular part. But we don't do it religiously. We don't do it for very long. And if you do or don't, it doesn't matter. What matters is a grateful, responsive, soft heart. Legalism, legalism says, I'm not going to watch that film. What would my pastor think? I might have seen it. I might not. Grace says... I won't watch this film. Or Grace says, Holy Spirit, shall I watch this film? No? Okay, cool. I'll watch something different. Vicar Dibley's on. (laughs) You don't want me to watch that either because it's no good? Okay, no, I'm kidding. (laughs) Do you get the difference? What would other people think? What does the Holy Spirit think? What does your heart feel? Instructed by the Holy Spirit. Massive difference. Huge. The difference between dead religion and a live relationship with a Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son. Legalism in their day, we saw it, it's horrible. Legalism in their day were these religious festivals, empty singing. I mean, fancy if anyone had ever said that about the band this morning. Come on, Johnny. It's just empty noise, mate. Very nice, is it? That's what they that's what Amos says to these people. It's empty noise. And it reminds us of that. I was at a wedding yesterday, it reminds us of that clanging symbol verse in 1 Corinthians 13. Without love, it's the same stuff. We can do all these things, but without love, without relationship, it's just dead religiosity, dead religious observance. It's all empty. But they thought, this is the thing. In chapter 5, they think with all these festivals and all this imp- impressive stuff, they think they're doing enough to get by, to justify all their greed and all their oppression. They're doing these things and boasting about their offerings and tithes. And even what they were doing was a mix of sin. You know when it says about, I don't know if you noticed it, but they were, they were using, they were offering leavened bread. They weren't meant to use yeast. They couldn't even get their religiosity right. They're such a mess. So God says to them in chapter 4, we read it, go to these altars you've got in Bethel and Gilgal. These places were good places. Go there and sin. Just carry on doing what you're doing. Such a contrast between legalism, self-reliance, and faith and trust in God. Such a huge contrast. And yet sometimes we, mi- we can minimise the difference. We can think there's hardly any difference. Sometimes they look similar. You know, I've said this before, but a well-meaning legalistic Christian can look very similar to a grace-filled, loving God, loving time in his prayer. Just, they can look very similar because they both don't watch the same films. Or whatever. This is the bit I was trying to talk about earlier. Verse 2 of chapter 4. And this is where I paused as we were reading. He swears by his holiness. Did you notice that? God swears. I mean, this is serious. He makes an oath on his own holiness. They are in so much trouble that he is swearing by his own holiness. It's it's, We we underestimate this because we read so much of these similar sorts of stories in the Old Testament which just describes the, 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 the state that humanity is in without trusting God, without knowing Him. And even when we do know Him, as we know as Christians, we can fall. But it, He is so angry. He swears by His holiness. And what's He angry with? What's grieved Him so much? What's underneath all of this? Is it just the greed? Is it just the oppression? No. Do you know what angers him in this context? What angers him to the point of swearing by his holiness is they have become self-reliant. That's what annoys him. They're no longer reliant on God. They're reliant on themselves. That's the root of all of this. That's what's 
makes him swear by his holiness. So angry. You're just reliant on yourselves. As much as when they built that calf of gold in the desert. Just turning away from him and relying on self angers him. Last week our focus did turn as we looked at the, the gift day. It did turn to the vision that we're going for as a church. But I was so clear, I hope you got this, that before we get to that and underneath all of that is that we give financially and in other ways, but we gave financially because Jesus gave himself for us. We gave because we know we've been forgiven much. Remember I talked about the lady that anointed Jesus' feet. She was loving much because she was forgiven much, but she was also giving much because she was forgiven much. We gave because we are no longer orphans who, can, who have to hoard, but we are sons and daughters who can trust our Father. We gave because the cross, as the early church shared everything in, that, in the beginning of Acts, remember we looked at it? They shared everything because the cross was still a living memory for them. It only just happened. Many of them had seen it. Many of them had seen Jesus and heard him preach. It was real. And in that context, they couldn't but hold back. They couldn't hold back. They shared everything. We see it as this kind of freaky one-off commune situation. No, I think they were living in the light of the cross. It was a raw memory for them. And when we have the raw memory of the effect of the cross on our lives, we are way more liberal in our generosity. Because he's done so much and it's raw. So that's why we give. And all of these things will keep us away from living in the truth of all of those reasons for giving even. Will keep us away from the meaninglessness of the religiosity that we see here in Amos. It will ter- in turn keep us from greed and oppressing others and looking down upon others and just going for our own selfish gain. Friends, this is a warning. It's a stark warning. It's not a pleasant warning. Amos was an interesting choice of book for us to go for. But it's a warning, fundamentally, to steer clear of self-reliance. You know, an orphan can only trust themselves. Who else do they trust? There's no one for them in that kind of orphanage we would describe it. They've got no one else. But if we stay in our sonship, if we stay in knowing who we are as princes and princesses, daughters and sons of the king, we will not stray into orphan territory where we can only rely on our best efforts. No, we will love knowing that we're loved. We'll give knowing that we are the recipients of the greatest gift. And in these ways, we'll remember who we are and steer clear of the havoc. And it does. Religiosity wreaks, creates havoc. We'll steer clear of it if we keep knowing who we are, knowing we're recipients, knowing we're loved. Do you this morning, do you know this is you? Do you know that you are, with Jesus, a son now, male and female? We're all sons in him, paid for. Your freedom has been paid for. Your life has been paid for. You were chosen. Did you know that? Did you know you were chosen? It says it in the beginning of Ephesians. Read read Ephesians 1. One of my favourite chapters. You were called. You were chosen in him. Before the creation of the world, it says. That's amazing. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Everything. You. Not next to you. Not in front of you. You. You're forgiven. That thing. You're forgiven. Have you have you repaired? Have you said, God, I'm sorry, forgive me? You're forgiven. If you haven't, say it. Then you'll be forgiven. You're already kind of forgiven. Because we won't remember everything we've sinned and done. We're still forgiven. I believe that. It's still good to repent and say, God, forgive me. It's good to live short accounts with him. But you're forgiven. You're forgiven. It can't rely on my memory. Do you know what I mean? You are a royal 
prince and princess. Did you know that? You're royalty. It doesn't get any better for you. Whatever you're going through, you couldn't be of a higher status. You couldn't be in a better place. Whatever you're going through, and that's not to belittle what you're going through, whatever you're going through, you are at this moment as royal as you'll ever be, as loved as you'll ever be, as forgiven as you'll ever be. And if you ever feel dry or in danger of going through the motions to the point of religious observance, just get back to the foot of the cross. Because there's no place for religiosity and greed and oppression of others at the foot of the cross. We're just overwhelmed, aren't we? When we're there. It's just, your whole vision's taken up. All you can see is your saviour hanging. That's how much he loved me. Oh, but I better perform. <laughs> I better not watch that film. Of course I don't need to watch that film. I don't care what film I watch. Look at him. Hanging. It struck me recently, I was listening to two very different pastors. A guy called Bill Johnson. Many would have heard the name. A guy called Jerry Bridges. I think Bill Johnson's probably in his 60s. This guy, Jerry Bridges, is in his 80s. They've both been Christians for a long time, both been church leaders for a long time. Do you know what? Both coming from very different kind of necks of the wood, as it were, in terms of expression of church. I um, love both and what they, what they bring to the party, as it were. Do you know Bill Johnson? He takes bread and wine personally himself every day. That struck me. He has a little collection of like wafer thin bread that he takes. Even when he was really ill, to the point where he couldn't eat, he was being intravenously fed. His wife would sit next to his bed and they would take communion together and she'd take it on his behalf, as it were. And the reason for that is he needs to come, as he would put it, he needs to come back to the cross. It, virtually every day he does this. He needs to come back to the cross daily. I thought, you know, I thought you'd be into faith and doing the miracles and now he comes back to the cross every day. And then this guy, Jerry Bridges, in his 80s, every day, he said this, every day before he gets out of bed, he preaches the gospel to himself. What? Yeah. He said, in his 80s, he said, in case, I mean, especially if it's a bad day, I, I don't even know if it's going to be a bad day. I need to know who I am. So I tell myself about the gospel again before I even get out of bed. Both of these guys have got something that we need to learn. I need to learn. Every day, talk to yourself. Every day, come back. You know, I thought Bethel and this guy, Bill Johnson, I thought they were kind of... I didn't think that... I was surprised, if I'm honest. Like I said, I thought it was all about the miraculous. Still about the cross. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? And all the freedom and all the healing that comes from the cross as well, yes, with Bill Johnson. But daily, both of them, the same story. Who am I remembering who I am? Do you remember every year when we have Armistice Day, when we have Remembrance Day? What's that phrase? Lest we forget. Now, I, I think it's so correct every year to honour those who have given of themselves to the ultimate point of dying for their, for, for their cause or for our country or for the country that we're from. Totally love that. But on a more incredible scale, friends, every day, let's remind ourselves, lest we forget who he is and who we are and end up with this nonsense in Amos. Let's get, get nowhere near this. Because we every day Remind ourselves. If the band would like to come up, please. If you'd like to stand with me, please. As we worship, as we finish, let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you going through the motions? 
just take a moment, ask you this serious question. You might be here this morning and you are feeling like you're just going through the motions. Or you're close to it. You're, you're concerned that this is becoming monotonous and you're drying up. And you'd love to meet with God in a powerful way right now. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. And for all of us, I'm going to pray for us. God, keep us away from religious observance. Keep me so in awe of you, so mindful of all that you've done. Loving your presence, loving you, so grateful for the cross. I'm going to pray that kind of blanket prayer for everyone. But if you're here and you're just slightly wary of your own heart going cold, I'm going to pray God reignites that <coughs> first love for him. This is, friends, this is massive. It, look, it, it can sound like just words, but this is huge. On your deathbed, it won't matter how much money you earn or how lovely your family is or isn't or how great a career you built. It will matter what you and Jesus talk about. It will matter how you feel about him. Lord Jesus, we just want to this morning or this afternoon say, Lord, it is all about you. And where there are those of us just feeling a bit dry and in danger of going through the motions, Lord, we want to turn around from that. We want to repent from that and say, God, soften our hearts again. Make it all about you again. Take us back to that first love again. We don't want to get that warning like the church in the beginning of Revelation got. Your hearts are hard. Go back to your first love. We want to do that right now. Today's the day. Holy Spirit, soften our hearts. Whatever it is that might be in the way, we give it up. Say, Lord, we love you first. And for all of us, Lord, keep us. Lest we forget who you are, who we are in you, all that you've done. Keep us amazed by grace. Keep us from dryness. Keep us from joylessness. Even in tough situations, Lord, we know the joy of our hearts is that I am numb by the King. Get in. What is there? What more is there? Amen. Sorry, get in is a phrase I use. It means I'm excited. So let's, let's worship.